copy of God's Word this morning. As we begin our message today, I'd like to uh, thank our church family for being the type of church that um, loves the Word of God. You know, from time to time, someone will ask a question, I'll get an email, or uh, someone will call up on the phone and say, you know, on Sunday morning you mentioned this, what do you mean by that? And I really appreciate when someone has a question, especially about the Word of God, because the Bible tells us as, ch- as, as a church, we're to be diligent in studying the Bible. We're to be like the Bereans and make sure that the things that I say are true and the things that each other teach in our classes are, are indeed the Word of God. And so thank you for that. You know, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 3 that there is going to come a time in which the church is not going to endure sound doctrine but rather they're going to want to hear, the Bible says that they have itching ears. They, they only want to hear uh, what they want to hear. <laughs> they don't want anyone to tell them what is true and what is not true. And I'm thankful that at Faithway, you enjoy doctrine. You enjoy chewing on the word of God. Because if you don't have doctrine, solid doctrine in your life, it's easy for someone to get up on the pulpit on Sunday morning and say, don't drink and smoke and, and run with those who do, right? Uh, don't drink, smoke, and chew and run with those who do. That's how it used to go. It's easy for someone to get up and say something like that, but if you don't have an underlying doctrinal foundation for why we do what we do, then it becomes very easy for us to be led astray by false teachers. And so when you look at what the Apostle Paul is doing in Romans chapter 6, we have had chapter after chapter after chapter of solid doctrine. I mean, he is just giving it to us left and right. And we're going to get into some very practical things starting in chapter 8 and chapter 9, chapter 10, especially chapter 12 where Paul tells us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. But if you look at how Paul operates and how he writes, for example, the book of Ephesians is a great book. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 talks about our relationship with each other in the body of Christ, our tongues. Ephesians 5 talks about marriage. Ephesians 6, children obey your parents in the Lord. And there's some very direct commands about how we are to live our life. But before we get to children obey your parents and husbands love your wives, Paul backs up chapters 1, 2, and 3 with just some incredible verses about God and who God is. So before he gets to the practical, he always builds it up and says, here's the doctrinal. Doctrine is very important. And so I appreciate the fact that you're sticking with me now through six chapters. You say, well, I don't really have a choice. I got you. But I appreciate the fact that you're sticking with us now through six amazing chapters of doctrine, because if you want to know how you should behave, you need to know what you believe in the Word of God. And if it comes down to someone saying, tell me how to behave or tell me what to believe, always land on what should I believe. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. I know you probably get tired of hearing me say something like that from the pulpit, but really, it, it matters not what I say, but what does the Word of God say? So Paul starts with the doctrinal question. And then in verse number chapter 6, I want you to look down at chapter 6, verse number 6. Paul says, knowing this. Well, knowing what? Well, he goes on. Before we got there, though, he says, uh, chapter ver- or chapter 6, verse number 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So last week we looked at our identification in Christ. Because we are in Christ... Knowing this, verse number 6, keep reading with me, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died... He died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Let's pray together this morning. Father, as we get into God's word, your word, I pray that you would open our eyes, that we would behold wondrous things out of thy law. Lord, be our teacher today, and I pray that we would understand fully what it means to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I thank you for the new life that we have in Jesus Christ, and Lord, I pray that you would continue to guide us through this time, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we begin this morning, David, I forgot, David, could you get a handheld microphone for me? I'm going to need one here in a couple of minutes. Um, but uh, yeah, if you could, is there one up there on the front? Oh, one more. Okay, I appreciate that. Just a handheld here in just a moment. As we begin this morning, I want you to think about probably the most overused illustration of faith that uh, the church has ever experienced. You probably have heard about this before, right? 
This is a chair, and I know it was used at the convention, Republican convention. I'm not going to use it uh, the same way that that guy used it. But this is a chair this morning, right? I-, I think all of us this morning, for the most part, are sitting in chairs. How many of you, when you got here to church this morning, before you sat down, turned the chair over and checked out the welds on the underside of your chair to make sure that it was safe? Anybody here? Maybe somebody is OCD like that and you did. I don't think any of us did, right? We have faith. We believe that the chair that you're sitting in this morning is not going to fall when you sit in it. It's going to hold your weight, right? That's probably a very well-familiar used illustration when it comes to what faith is truly all about. And what Paul is telling us here in this text is that we need to know and we need to have confidence and we need to have faith in the Word of God. How many of you, just in open transparency this morning, how many of you have ever gone through a time in your life in which you would shame, you hate to say it, you're ashamed to say it, but you walked away from the Lord for a time? Anybody like that? And I know I have. I I turned my back on God and decided for a while I was going to go and do my own thing. How many of you, if maybe you raised your hand a moment ago, but would raise your hand and say, you know, I can identify a time in my life when I was closer to God than I am at this very present moment. Anybody like that this morning? I know I can say that as well sometimes. There are times that I feel like I am closer to the Lord. Maybe it's a circumstance I'm going through or it's believing that God is in control. If so, why? Why? Why did you walk away from God? Why do you not feel as close to God this morning as you felt before in other times in your life? The answer is, then you believe something then that you don't believe now, or you believe something now that you don't believe then. So here's a question for you. What do you know this morning about Superman? What do you know about Superman? I know it's, you say, what does this have to do with the Word of God? I'll get back to it in a minute. Do you realize that Superman has a longer Wikipedia page than some of the presidents of the United States? I mean, there is a ton of information out there about Superman. Well, uh, he's from the planet, what, Krypton. His parents sent him to Earth right before Krypton exploded. His powers include but are not limited to flight, strength, super speed, and vulnerability to non-magical powers. He has x-ray, infrared, and microscopic vision. He has super hearing. He has super breath that allows him to blow out air at freezing temperatures. That's what I know to be true about Superman. Probably a lot of other things that the inventors of Superman came up with. Superman. How many of you have ever seen Superman before? I know the other day Sam was wearing a Superman shirt, but that Sam's not Superman. Unless, well, Nikki would say he is, but most of us agree that Sam's not Superman. How many of you have ever seen him before? No, none of us have, right? How many of you ever, have ever flown with Superman? How many of you have ever had Superman rescue your car as the bad guy is pushing your car towards the cliff and it's about to fall over. Anybody ever had an experience like that? No. Anyone ever been to the planet Krypton? <laughs> no, I hope you haven't been there before. If not, we can have some counseling after the service, okay? Superman is not a real person. I know it's shocking to some of you, but he's not. Jesus Christ, he was born in Nazareth, or sorry, Bethlehem. He was born in a manger. He fled to uh, the country of Egypt when Herod was trying to kill him. They brought him back to uh, to Nazareth where he grew up after Herod died. For the first 30 years of his life, he lived in the town of Nazareth as an apprentice to his father, who was a carpenter. After his, uh, when he reached age 30, he began his public ministry. He was crucified, he was buried, and he rose again. And beloved, that's just not biblical fact, that's historical fact. It's been recorded in history. Now listen carefully. If you based your life this morning on Superman, it would be a sad life indeed because you would be basing your life upon something that is not true. But if you base your life upon Jesus Christ, you can have ultimate victory in your life over sin and over temptation because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. One of the most important verses, I believe, for every Christian to memorize, and if you do not have this verse memorized, I encourage you to memorize it this week. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 5. The Bible says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Do you get what Paul said there? Every thought that we have in our mind were to bring into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You say, why is that important? The Bible tells us that we must separate those things that are fantasy from those things that are true. Don't give in to the fantasy of thinking things that are not true. You say, well, what is fantasy thinking? It's accepting something as true. But you know, the Bible tells us in his word, listen, the Bible says in in the word of God that a soft answer turns away wrath. How many of you believe that? 
All right, soft answer turns away wrath. I believe it. But how many of you, when you were driving down Route 7 and you got cut off by somebody in the, in the rain, truly believe that a soft answer turneth away wrath? You see, we believe what we believe when we act upon it. And Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse number 6, knowing this, knowing what? Knowing that we are saved, act upon it. When I attempt to form truth, no matter what I believe, it is dangerous because I will act upon that truth. That is why my foundation must be in the word of God. Okay, what do I need to know about God? Well, the psalmist said about God, truly God is God. Do you believe that this morning, that God is God? You say, yes, I do. Okay, if, if you believe that God is God, then you believe that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. If you believe that God is God, then I believe that everything in my life that is outside of my control happens because God, who is good, sent it. Do you believe that God will supply all of your needs? He tells us in Philippians 4.13 that God will meet all of our needs. Do you believe that? Okay, then when you go to the pantry at the end of the month and there's not as much food because there's more month than money at the end of the month, if you know what I'm talking about, then you believe that God will supply your needs. Do you believe that? Does God always meet your needs? If God is good and God is always good, do you believe that God will always forgive your sin? Do you believe that God is good in my life? If so, do you believe that God will always love me personally? You realize what God said in his word? He says, yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, and with kindness I have drawn you. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. When I was dating my wife, we would write love letters back and forth to each other, and still sometimes on Valentine's Day and special events, I write her a note and let her know I love her, but not as frequently as I should be doing probably. But, you know, I look back at the letters that I've written her, and we had some sappy love. Oh, I love you, love you, love you. And those are important to have when you're building a relationship, and even after you're married, to continue to maintain that relationship. But I don't think I ever wrote, Liz, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and with loving kindness have I drawn you. Do you understand the love that God has for us is far greater than a love that we can have for a human being? That is the God of the Bible. And because God is true and we are not true, and, or we are true and God is not, if you believe that God loves you, then you're going to act accordingly. So when Satan comes knocking at your heart's door this next week and tries to tempt you to sin, you say, no, I believe that my father loves me more than this sin loves me. Therefore, I am not going to delve into that sin because I want to please the father who loves me. I believe that the Bible is true. Therefore, I reject all other books that claim to be true. You follow me? What do you believe to be true? I talked to a Mormon in line. I think I was at Chick-fil-A this week. I forget where I was at. And I was talking to a Mormon. And he, you know, he was telling us that he believed the Bible, the King James Version of the Bible is what they use, just like we do at our church, he mentioned. And I said, well, that's interesting, but, but you also have another book. And we started getting into a little debate about, not a debate, but you know, the authority of the Word of God and the insp inspired Word, and, and compared that to the Book of Mormon. And I told him why I believe the Bible alone was sufficient for everything that I need in life. And he really didn't take it too well. But, you know, the reason I believe the Bible is the word of God is because it's changed my life and there are so many proofs in it. And if you believe that this book is indeed the word of God, then you will reject all other books that claim to be the inspired word of God. It makes sense to everybody here today? So what you believe determines how you act. And that's what the Apostle Paul says in verse number six. He says, knowing this, okay, knowing what? Knowing this fact that God has saved us, there's something that I want you to do. Verse number 6, if you notice, is very similar to verse number 9. Knowing that Christ being dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion um, over him. Why is it so important to know? Can't you just tell me what I need to do and I can get on with my life? And Paul says, no, we need to get something. What does he say we need to get? Number one, don't forget who the old man is. Knowing this that our old man is crucified with him, verse number six, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. The old Barney Schwenke, what happened to him? The Bible says he died with Christ. Hey, the old you, if you're saved this morning, what happened to the old sin nature? Hey, he died with Christ. People talk about crucifying the old man. And Paul says, if you look at verse number six, notice the tense of this verse. The old man has been, past tense, crucified, is crucified with him. 
In the Greek, it's it happened in the past. It's something that took place a long time ago. Christ has won the victory. Now, I have to admit, in the past I have preached, I've been guilty of preaching, you've got to crucify the old man every day. Question for you, how can you crucify something that is already dead? How can you kill something that's already been dead? You've got to understand this morning, the old man, he died with Christ. You changed your identification. On August 6, 2005, I changed my identification. On that day, I stood in front of a pastor and about 300 people at a church in Southington, Connecticut, and I stood across from my bride, and I said, and the pastor said, well, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. By the authority vested in me as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss the bride, and I kissed her. <laughs> and then we went on and walked down those steps and out the door of the church, and I changed my identification. I walked into the building that day with my buddies as a single man, and I walked out the door that day not holding any of my friend, my guy, you know, no, the guys, they weren't holding my hand. No, I was holding my wife's hand. We walked out of the door together. Went in single, went out together. I got a new identification. You know, before I got married, I, I don't know, some of you single people, maybe this happens from time to time. People would try to set me up on blind dates. <laughs> it never worked out too good for me. When I was in Florida, there was a guy, I worked in the ship ministry when I was at college, and we would come in and we would minister to all of the people on the ships that had to stay in the Pensacola Harbor. They couldn't get off the boat. They had to stay on the boat. But we would go and we would preach and bring gifts to them, and we would just have a good time getting to know them while they were in harbor for a couple of weeks. And uh, there was one guy, his name was Brother Dewey. He was a pastor in Milton, Florida of a church down there. And Brother Dewey, he had a four, I think he had a step-granddaughter that was single. <laughs> and he would always pull out his wallet and say, Schwanky, what do you think about her? <laughs> I'm like, oh, Brother Dewey, I don't know. Would you like to go out to dinner with her? I can set you up and we can go out to Mexican food. And I don't know, because he had some connections at a local Mexican restaurant. Blind dates just never worked out for me. And I got frustrated after a while, people trying to hook us up. And that's why I'm glad that I met my wife and I never have to worry about blind dates again. But if I were to accept a blind date now that I am married, what would I be doing? I would be denying my identification, right? I would be going against my identification. Could I go on a date with someone else now that I am married? Yes, I could. I could. But I choose not to. Why? Because I'm married to Liz. Do you understand the difference? I have a new identification. I still can sin. I still can, I can still do what's wrong, but I choose not to because I am, I, I'm with Christ and Christ is with me. And the word of God teaches it is possible for me to act like an unbeliever, but I'm not supposed to because I have a new identity. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he's a Scottish preacher, and I listen to him in a sermon preparation for almost every one of these messages. I think it's on sermonaudio.com if you want to go listen to him. He's an amazing preacher. And he says there, uh, one quote that he said about this text, he said, understand that the old man is not there. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone before and you realize that they weren't there? You're just talking, 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 wondering how long you've been talking. A couple of months ago, our, our washing machine bit the dust. And so you know how it is. You go to Home Depot or Lowe's and you get a new one and they tell you, well, we'll deliver it to your house on such and such day, but we can't tell you exactly what time. So you've got to be available all day long, right? And so the day came when we were supposed to get the washing machine and I was waiting for that call from the Lowe's delivery department and I was waiting and waiting and then the phone rang and someone in the church called me and I won't mention their name this morning. They called me. And they started talking and talking and talking. And then the phone rang, you know, a call waiting. There was a number. I didn't recognize it, but I knew it probably was most likely the delivery people. And I tried to get this person's attention that I was talking to. And I tried to get Bobby to stop talking, but he wouldn't. He just didn't hear me. And so I, I had to take the phone call, so I switched over, and I talked to the people. And they said, we'll be there in 15 minutes. I said, okay. I hung up the phone, and... And then went back to the other phone call, and Bobby was still talking. <laughs> he, he didn't even know that I had switched over and got the phone call. What do you do when you realize you're not talking to anybody? Well, Bobby didn't realize it, but normally you hang up the phone, right? That's it. It doesn't make any sense to talk to someone that's not there. And, beloved, now that you are saved, there is no one, that, there is no one in this room that has to continue to talk to Satan. You understand the conversation is now over. I am free in Christ. True believers, they will sin and they do sin, but not without guilt and not without frustration and not without misery. You know why? Because you cannot truly continue to find joy in sin. The Bible says that there is pleasure in sin for a season. Oh, yes, sin is pleasurable, but it always comes with frustration that is greater than the perceived pleasure of sin. It always does every single time. 
Why is that? Because I am not the person that I used to be. Look at verse number 6 one more time. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. What is the body of sin? Well, a great way to illustrate that would be, um, I, I guess it's a vehicle, okay? A vehicle of sin. In other words, I have gained, you and I have gained the ability to do right, but our bodies still retain the ability to do wrong. How so? Through the vehicle of sin, all right? This right here in my hand, this is a vehicle that I'm holding right here. This is a microphone, right? And this microphone is a vehicle through which my voice is transmitted. I can use this microphone to transmit words of encouragement and to transmit the word of God. I can encourage you with this microphone, but I also could say some things that are heretical. I could say some things that are unkind. I could be abusive or inappropriate or clearly sinful with this vehicle. This microphone in and of itself is not sinful. It simply is an agent through which my voice passes. And that is the same way that we look at our bodies. Our bodies, our, our body, our, our mind, our soul, our body, or rather our, our mind, our hands, our, our feet, they're simply agents that the devil tries to use as, as a channel for sin in our life. But when you got saved, you realized that all that you had to offer God was nothing but, but filthy rags. And my very best that I had could not compare to Jesus Christ. So all of my works, they're woefully insufficient. That's all that I could do. But now after I got saved in Christ, my identification is no longer with Adam. My identification is in Christ. Okay, so what is the body of sin? Well, it's the vehicle of sin. My hands, my feet, my tongue, my mind. Sin uses us as a vehicle through which it travels. So, what is Paul saying then in verse number 6? That the body of sin might be destroyed. Now, when you think about destruction, you think about maybe Hiroshima or, or Nagasaki and when they bombed with the nuclear bomb, there was nothing left of those cities, right? Utter and complete destruction. But let me ask you, how many of you lost your capacity to sin when you trusted Christ? Anybody here? Anybody lose their capacity to sin when you trusted Christ? Okay, if that's not the case, then what does this ver verse mean? Where's that microphone at? Phil, is that up there in the front somewhere? And then, oh, right back here. Okay, let's say this microphone, for example, humor me, this is a microphone. Everyone follow me? Okay, but, but let's just say that this microphone here this morning, if I were to take the battery out of this microphone here today, what good is it to Phil if he were to come up and sing? Is this microphone of any use to anybody here today if I were to take this battery out? No. Uh, really, there's no purpose for this microphone. You wouldn't want to stir uh, your, your cookies up with it. Uh, you really wouldn't want to give it to a kid for a play toy. They might get their tongue stuck in the little pieces there. Uh, you know, there's really no other use for this thing other than the purpose for what it was designed for, right? If I were to take this microphone, and John Gershing don't have a heart attack, but if I were to take this and I were to chuck it against the wall and I were to stomp on it and I were to make this thing just absolutely unrecognizable, I would annihilate it, I would destroy this completely. That's a different Greek word than what we have here in verse number 6. The word that we have there for destroy is the Greek word kartegio, which simply means to unplug. It means to take the battery out. It means simply to no longer um, be able to fuel something. Did you get annihilated when you trusted Christ? No. You didn't get your old, you still have the ability to sin. Do you know what happened when you got saved? In a sense, you got unpowered. How many of you have ever run out of gas before? I know I have, and you run out of gas, and putter, 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 and you pull over the side of the road, and you say, oh, Liz, why didn't you fill up gas the other day? And she never fills up gas. It's my job. But anyways, you know, you find anyone else to blame but yourself, and I ran out of gas a couple of years ago, and, you know, the light comes on, you pull over, and you're like, oh, what am I going to do? You know, when you pull your car over to the side of the road because you ran out of gas, you don't have the tow truck take it to the junkyard, do you? Why? Unless it's a, uh, yeah, Volvo, <laughs> maybe you do. But, you know, you don't have your car taken to the junkyard because it's still good, right? It's still worth something. It's still valuable to you. It, it just became unplugged. It became unpowered. It ran out of gas. Your vehicle has been rendered ineffective. Did the vehicle lose its inability? No, but it lost its power. What does it mean in verse number 6 for the body of sin to be destroyed? It doesn't mean that it's been eradicated. Rather, it means it's been unplugged. The believer has experienced a radical transformation in his life 
the old self and the old man has died, and we retain that vehicle of sin, but through Christ, that vehicle has been rendered powerless. So in chapter 12, Paul is going to tell us in verse number 1, to present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. But, but we got to, before we get to that point where we can surrender ourselves completely to him, we got to know some things. we got to know that we've been unplugged from the old man, that we're not forced to serve him any longer. Does that make sense, beloved? This battery, this microphone, once I put this battery in, boy, it can do a lot of things. Out of the same mouth can come blessings and cursings, God says in James. And that microphone, this vehicle, can either be an agent for good or it can be an agent for sin. Remember last week we looked at the reign of death of Christ on the cross in the first part of this chapter. And we said now we have a new identification in Jesus Christ. We said that our identity has been marked paid in full by Jesus Christ himself. There's a new sheriff in town, right? We don't have to give in to him anymore. I, I love Paul's illustration of marriage in Ephesians chapter number 5. He says that I am the bride of Christ. He is the head. I am in him. And my identity is now in Christ. That's why when, when there's a marriage ceremony, that's why the woman will change her last name because of the picture of Christ in the church, right? Christ, we, our, identity, our, our identity is with him. We went from being a sinner to now being a saint. When a husband and wife get married, the wife changes her name because she has now assumed the identity of her husband. That is the same thing that Paul teaches here in Romans chapter number 6. Did you realize, beloved, that we have a little 9-volt battery that, that fuels this microphone? But now that you're saved... When you died, you, when you got saved, you died to the old man. You became unplugged, that old 9-volt battery. Hey, you can throw that battery away because it's no good anymore. But you have the ability to be super-powered by the Lord Jesus Christ. You can now be engaged in things that are worthy. Before you got saved, you were involved in worthless things. But now, through God's strength and God's power, you can be doing things that will count for all of eternity. So here's the question this morning as we close. As you look back at your week this past week, have you been living your life up to your identity? Your source, your power is Jesus Christ. If you are truly, if you know Christ, you have an option to act like you are. You don't need to give in to lust. You don't need to have a filthy mouth. You don't have to lose your temper and be angry all of the time. You don't have to have fear and worry. You don't have to give in to self-centeredness and think that life is all about you. Because listen, life is not all about you. It's about him. And that's what we must remember. You don't have to be the one that constantly stirs up things in the family or constantly stirs up things in the church family. Why not? Because I am crucified with Christ. I have a new identification. I have a new battery that is powering my vehicle now. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my new power. And so as we close today, I want you to close with knowing. Knowing the fact that we've been crucified with Christ. One of the challenges in the modern era today for the church is to know truth and is to reject error. How can you know what truth is? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. I was talking to a man yesterday, and he was sharing his testimony with me. And he was a product of the 1960s and 70s. In fact, he said in the 70s, he had a rock band they thought was going to go all the way to the big time. And then he met Christ, and he got saved. And he and his brothers were in this band. They got all mad at him because uh, he, he felt like he could not continue on as a Christian doing the things and living the lifestyle uh, that, that the people back then were involved in. If you were familiar with that type of li atmosphere and lifestyle, you know what I'm talking about. And any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. And when this guy got saved, he really got saved. But he said, the reason I got saved was this. He said, I was a product of, of the hippie movement. And as I was walking around and I was looking for truth, I tried it in drugs. I tried to find it in relationships. I tried it in all the mystical, uh, uh, the religions of the world, Eastern religions. And I looked and I looked and I looked for truth and I never found it. He said, but then someone came to my dorm room and talked to me about Jesus and he said, the moment I heard the gospel, I knew that there was the truth. I, he said, I don't know how to describe it, but it just made sense. It clicked. I knew this was what I was searching for. 
And if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. This man has changed his life, and he's walking with God. And it's amazing to see what God has done in this man's life and his ministry and how God has enabled him to serve him over the past, of the, over the, over the past 35 years that he's been able to walk with God. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know your past. I don't know if you're saved this morning. I don't know if you're not saved. But God can take anybody who has a past, and he can introduce you to the truth, which is his son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us in John 1, 1, Jesus said, or the Bible tells us about Christ, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. You understand, Jesus Christ is saying that he is the living word of God. You say, okay, this week you asked me, how did I do living up to my identity in Jesus Christ? Well, if you didn't really live like a Christian this week, can I ask you a question? What did you do with the word this week? If Jesus is truth, and the truth is the word of God, what did you do with God's word? You say, you keep saying that. God's will for your life is a daily walk with him. Read your Bible and pray. Read your Bible and pray. Listen, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Hey, you want to get right with God? Take heed thereto according to his word. You've got to digest the word of God. I'm going to ask each and every one of us here this morning to do something this week. And it's going to require some time. It's going to be about three and a half minutes of your day. I think all of us can probably spare three and a half minutes. You're supposed to brush your teeth for two minutes, right? So three and a half minutes a day, I'd like to give to the word of God in something very specific. Romans chapter 6 is a short chapter. There's 23 verses here. And I'd like you for the next week to give yourself to reading Romans 6 one time per day. You say, well, I read other things. I I get that. I understand that. You may do that for other things, three devotions. But there's some things in here that we need to know. And next week, we're going to take a look at another passage of Scripture, starting in verse number, verse number 11. And I want to get to this where everyone in our church knows where we're going, so we can rightly divide the word of truth. You say, I struggled to live a life pleasing to God this week. What are you doing with the word? Are you digging God's word? Are you opening into, getting into it and reading it and digesting it and making it a part of who you are? If you want to cleanse your way, if you want to draw close to God, you got to draw. He, he, if you want God rather to draw nigh to you, close to you, you got to draw close to God. So give yourself fully to the Word. Give yourself fully to a relationship with God this week, so people can see Jesus Christ living in you. This week, would you be willing to spend three and a half minutes a day reading Romans chapter six? Maybe four if you're a slow reader. It shouldn't take you much longer than that. Read through this passage and get to know it inside and out. Make it a part of your life this week. And beloved, as you do that, I believe it'll transform your life because other people will see Jesus Christ in you. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much that we don't have to give in to sin. I thank you that the victory has been won for us through the Lord Jesus Christ when he died on that cross. And Lord, I pray today that we would start living in our new identity. That the body of sin, Lord, it's been unplugged. It's been depowered from our life. And Lord, when we go home and we're tempted to yell at our family, when we're tempted to be, uh, Lord, maybe morally something comes up on the computer screen this week or watching something on television that just doesn't please you, I pray that we would, rather than giving in to that lust, that you would help us to remember that it's been crucified with Jesus Christ. That before I was saved, I had to go to that. Like a dog just goes and eats vomit. I used to have to go after that sin. But Lord, I don't have to anymore. I've been delivered from that. I pray, Father, that you would just give us victory. And, but Lord, we would walk close with you, not so we can pat ourselves on the back and say, what good Christian I am, but so other people can see Jesus Christ in us, and then they would be drawn toward the lifestyle, and, Lord, that they would come to know Christ, too, as their Savior. I pray, Father, that we would walk with you this week. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'd like to ask you this morning, if you would be willing before God today to make a commitment to read your Bible, To spend time in God's word. It's the only thing that's going to change your life. Listen, if I go through my day and I don't read the Bible, I can fake it for a while. But my wife will come to me in a little while and she'll say, Hey, Barney, did you read your Bible today? (laughs) And I'd say, No. And take some time out of my life, whatever I'm doing, and I go spend time with God. Because if I don't, I'm not walking in the spirit. And it's evident to my family. And it's evident to people that I run across. 
and it will ruin my relationships with them if I'm not walking with the Lord. But I'm not so much concerned about ruining my relationships with them as I should be about ruining my relationship with the Lord. He loved me so much that he sent Jesus to die on that cross for me. And so, my friend, if you don't know Christ today, would you call out to him and ask him to save you? But if you do know him, would you commit to being more of a student of the word, of asking the Lord to work in your heart, to transform you to be more like Jesus Christ? If you'd like to make that a part of your life and your prayer this morning, as Sarah plays on the piano, we'd like to give you an opportunity in the quietness of this moment to respond to the Lord. Talk to him. Tell him what you want to do this week and ask him to give you the strength and the courage to make the word a part of your life. Let's pray together.